turning it over to Mr. Richard Brennan. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Walk the Talk. We are excited tonight for a number of reasons. First of all, how about Joe Hart and Walk the Talk Band? Please give it up for them. We're excited that this is our first time in bringing this program to the Basile Theater at the historic Athenaeum. That's really cool. And we, Steve and I, both want to thank Cassie Stockhamp, who's in a house somewhere, who's president of the Athenaeum, for helping to make this possible. So thank you, Cassie, wherever you are. Founder of Monumental Yoga as well. And we're also excited that tonight we celebrate our second anniversary for Walk the Talk. It started at, yes, please. It started at the Vogue. We have about four or five a year. Uh, then we went to the Buskirk Chumley in Bloomington, and now tonight here. And the reason Steve had the vision for coming here is he wanted these programs to be enjoyed by kids under 21, because the Vogue, you've got that age cutoff thing, 21 and above. So we're excited that you're all here. This is a very, very popular and important topic, signs and synchronicities. The six speakers that we will have out here tonight will each give their own snapshot share their own story of what signs and synchronicities meant for them in their journey. Before I introduce our first speaker, there's two more people I have to introduce. They might not be coming out right now, but they will be on the stage at the end of the program. First of all, Jennifer Brandusi, who really is the glue that holds this together. She's stage manager, program director. She's a viral video star, courtesy of A Taste of Broad Ripple. But, Show a lot of love for the guy who's also co-founder of this. But more than that, he holds the vision for this. He is passionate about what Walk the Talk can actually do in people's lives and how we're growing this tribe. He's been known as the owner of the Vogue in Broad Ripple, but he's so much more than that because this actually wouldn't have ever taken place without his efforts. So show a lot of love, a lot of loud applause. He'll be on the stage at the end. Mr. Steve Ross, wherever he is. Well deserved. Okay, you're here for the speakers. Our first speaker has been with Walk the Talk before when we were at the Vogue. Her presentation was powerful. She's a great storyteller, weaves those things together beautifully. Maybe that's because she used to be a dance instructor. And when she was a little girl, she had a desire to really want to have conversation with strangers. Not only just talk to them, but listen to them. So guess what she is now? She's a therapist. Not my therapist, but she is a therapist. She's a great communicator. She does a lot of speaking. Please welcome to the stage tonight, Danielle Ireland. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Hello. When it comes to signs and synchronicity, it seems as if on the farthest ends of the spectrum, you have one side that falls under magic and mysticism, where God, the universe, source, divinely orchestrate exactly what you need to see, exactly when you need to see it. And on the other, we have reason and meaning making, and we would call this perspective maybe more logical. Well, when we think about the two hemispheres of our brain, one more feeling and perceiving, the other more logical and analytical, we could actually see how both are correct in terms of our biology. And then there is this space in the middle called the corpus callosum. It's a bundle of nerves and fibers that connects our two hemispheres, our two extremes, and allows them to communicate with one another. In 2013, an evolutionary anthropologist noted after studying images of Albert Einstein's brain that his genius could have been largely attributed to higher levels of internal connectivity in his brain. Basically, his corpus callosum was huge and it meant his right and left side communicated very well. Now, this finding could also be a coincidence, right? No causal connection. It's luck, it's chance, it's happenstance, and 
I've come to really appreciate and value how Dr. Wayne Dyer broke down the etymology of the word coincidence, that within the word we find coincide. Coincide being two points that fit together perfectly, intersect, and occupy the same space. Much like the corpus callosum functions in our brain, could an intersection between faith and logic form a coincidence? I had a pretty big coincidence myself a couple years ago. I was about a week out from finishing graduate school. I had a job lined up with therapists that I looked up to, admired, revered, and just secretly really, really, really wanted them to like me. <laughs> all of the chips were starting to stack in my favor to feel like, hey kid, you checked all the boxes, you made it, sit back, relax. But instead, what I was doing was imagining myself in this new future, thinking, no one's gonna take you seriously. Who are you kidding? And I started to get very nervous and overwhelmed. And I should note that when I get nervous and overwhelmed, I have what I call shame glaze, which is basically stress sweat. It's also <laughs> when I learned that my husband loved me unconditionally because I was pretty stinky. But it's during those times in my life where, honestly, I couldn't positively process, gratitude journal, affirm, vent, talk through how I was feeling on my own, so instead I turned to prayer. And my prayer, being driven and motivated by fear and doubt, I needed some reassurance, I needed some comfort. So I asked for a sign, and the sign I asked for was a hummingbird. Full disclosure, I love hummingbirds. I have about six feeders at my house, so I knew that asking for a sign to see a hummingbird and then rushing home and waiting by a feeder wasn't really gonna give me the relief that I was looking for. But the next day, I'm walking down this hallway and it has these huge picture windows, like floor to ceiling windows. It's the third floor of a building downtown. And as I'm walking, this motion catches my peripheral vision and I turn and there's a hummingbird, hovers there for about three seconds and flies away. And I see this and I go, huh, okay. And I go on about my day and it doesn't really change anything. The next morning, I'm starting my day the way I typically did at that time. I'm on my third coffee and I'm anxiously making my bed and running through my to-do list and the stress sweat is starting and I'm feeling behind. And my thoughts are interrupted with this knocking, this tapping on the outside of my second story bedroom window. I go over to my window and I notice a red bird was pecking at the window. It sees me, flies away, and behind where the red bird was, was another hummingbird. And this hummingbird held its position for five Mississippi seconds, like one Mississippi, two Mississippi. It was like the two birds like got together and like, listen, this girl ain't getting it, so why don't you do this and I'll do this and then maybe she'll get it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> and this shock ran through my body of relief and it was my sign. Choosing to believe that something or someone heard me and then validated me, it, it was so comforting. And it made me a little braver stepping into this new phase of life. And isn't that really what we're looking for when we're asking for signs or when we're asking for help? Some confirmation that we're seen and heard. Dr. Maya Angelou has a saying about courage that courage is the most important of all virtue because without it, we can't practice any other virtue consistently. And when we're traveling to new destinations or moving through unknown territory, we, we need signs to help us get where we're going. And if we get lost, they help us get back on track. And isn't it interesting how we get more confident and familiar, we actually use the signs less. I can't name all the streets in my neighborhood. But in the face of uncertainty and scarcity, those signs, they make us a little braver to keep going. In The Gifts of Imperfection, one of my favorites, Dr. Brene Brown, notes that if we want to incorporate a new way of being, learn a new skill, apply a self-help guide to our lives, that it's equally as important that we understand the barriers and obstacles that can get in our way of doing this successfully or effectively, which leads me to technology and meaning making. Social media and technology have revolutionized the way that we consume goods, services, and information. I've actually been a part of conversations that sound something to the effect of, oh my God, you bought that in a store? That is so cute. Like we may one day look at shopping in brick and mortar stores the way I think of going antiquing. And these services, while incredible, transformative, revolutionary, I mean, we are in a digital age. And then we think about Alexa and Echo, even artificial intelligence, we will soon, one day, no longer need to type what we're searching for. And it's important to note that a lot of these services are driven by convenience. We think about it, we probably have supercomputers in our pockets right now, or at least on the table, right? And Google has, in some sense, eliminated the need for curiosity because the answers are right there. 
this can present some potential challenges when it comes to interpreting signs, such as affirmation versus information. The social circles that we interact with online largely consist of people we know, people we want to know, and people we already like. There is an inherent selection bias in the way that we choose to interact with people online. And over time, we begin to see the same stories, people, events, and we start to feel like we get a sense of certainty with a 100% degree and truth with a capital T. People that look like us, talk like us, and think the way we do. And this can affirm and narrow our view to seeing this is how people are, this is how I am, and this is where I fit. In an interview with David Letterman, President Obama noted that in a social experiment, someone took a conservative, moderate, and liberal person and had them Google search the word Egypt. At the top of the conservative person's search was the Muslim Brotherhood, the moderate was vacation destinations along the Nile, and the liberal was political protest. Whatever your biases are, that is what's coming to you. And here's another radical thought. When we think about advertising, algorithms, data mining, the internet is looking at us as much as we are looking at it. And if the lens through which we see the world comes from a computer, a tablet, or a cell phone, we must question what we see, or at least stay curious. Otherwise, we run the risk of becoming gridlocked in a polarized level of certainty. And then we add meaning making. Meaning making is our emotional mind's best attempt to fill in gaps of information based on how we feel. And if the way we feel is uncertain, scared, or afraid, that's going to inform what we see. The conclusions we draw, the assumptions we make, will be driven and motivated by a state of fear. Now we have fear on the side of shame, self-doubt, self-criticism, fear on the side of needing to manage, predict, control, or manipulate future outcome. On one side could be or feel like depression, be or feel like anxiety. If I were to walk into a coffee shop and I just have my heart broken, I'm knee deep in grief, I'm lonely, and I'm contacting everyone on my phone. I just want to contact someone, but no one's replying. I don't even get those three little wiggly lines or little dots. And I don't feel like I'm being seen and I walk into this coffee shop and the person on the other side doesn't even look at me. Is this my sign? Because it feels like evidence. It feels familiar. Or if it's Friday and I've got the cutest new outfit and I go selfie, 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 selfie. This is my angle who's got a little filter here. Hashtag humble, hashtag Friday, hashtag blessed. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. I don't want to be too anxious. I'm just going to, that's okay. Nobody's looked yet. It's fine. It's fine. I'm just going to give it a second. <laughs> this is so weird. Like, why doesn't anyone see this? Because this person's on the line, this person's online, this person's online. Poof. Is this my sign? Because this feels like evidence that I suck and I'm stupid and everyone else has got it more figured out than I do. Our fear loves nothing more than to prove itself correct. Its favorite statement, its slogan is, see, I told you, I told you. It's the same way we feel when we're kind of peeling out of a 12-hour Netflix binge and we're scrolling on our phones, seeing shiny, beautiful people doing shiny, beautiful things, somehow always in fields of wheat. And, <laughs> and we feel like we're covered in Cheeto dust and animal cracker crumbs. The the scariest and most challenging part of all of this work, whether it's asking for signs, asking for help, or getting more curious about the world we live in, is that as we start asking questions, we might lose that certainty, that righteousness, that sense of truth with a capital T. And uncertainty can feel unstable, which can feel unsafe, which can be terrifying. A couple years ago, I got a hummingbird. Well, actually, I got two. Yet in the face of each new presenting challenge, each new obstacle, I still wrestle with fear, self-doubt, stress sweat, and hopefully finding the courage to question whether it's possible for me to try. This work is, it's incredibly vulnerable, but it's potentially the bravest thing we could ever do. Thank you.
nice as you can remember. Oh, yes. okay. Thank you so much. Blessings to you. Yeah. I'm sure you all have your own voice story on there, too. One of the things I love about Walk the Talk is this. It gives an opportunity for anybody in the community, including Bloomington now, to audition and speak on a stage. For years, I had a not-for-profit where we invited all these high-priced spiritual teachers to come to India, and that was cool. But this is so much more meaningful for me because the stories that I'm hearing, the lessons that I'm learning from past speakers, from our speakers tonight, it's amazing. Now, I'm sharing that also because our next speaker has never spoken on a stage in front of this many people before. But she's ready. She's a pursuer of authenticity. I love that, pursuer of authenticity. She loves science. She is a scientist. But she's blending that in also with metaphysics, which she has now embraced once again. Please welcome to the stage Erica Allen. Hello. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm ex excited to share my story of transformation with you and how I broke up and woke up to signs and synchronicities. So my story tonight actually starts because I changed my email address. This is what it used to be, eballen1011 at Gmail. And I chose that because I got married on October 11th to a guy I had reconnected with from high school. And we chose that date because in high school, my goal was to graduate in the top 10. And I was 11th, but he was 10th. So we would always joke that the relationship never would have worked had it been the other way around. And so despite the proper order of our class rankings, that marriage still broke up. And when it did, I changed my email address to this, Erica Allen, 1111. <laughs> and for me at the time, all that meant was a very empowered, no more 10, me twice, 1111. But I didn't realize I'd opened a portal <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> Once I did this, I started getting articles in my Facebook feed about the significance of 1111, seeing repeating numbers everywhere, reading these articles, seeing it on the clock, license plates, receipt totals. But um, as Richard mentioned, I'm more of a science logic person, so I didn't think too much of it. I thought it was a bunch of hippy-dippy baloney, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but it was fun to read about. But then my divorce was final on February 22nd, so 222. And I thought, well, can't make that up. I wasn't looking. Uh, and so I decided I would talk to my best friend about it. I knew she would have a unique perspective because she was nearing the end of her life. Uh, she had been sick with cancer for the previous two years. And so we talked about spiritual things often. And actually, three and a half months after that divorce was final, I watched her die. And then I was really broken up, really shattered grief-stricken, I felt isolated, alone, and I missed my friends, missed the marriage. And people in the friend group, they used to always talk about um, seeing dragonflies, and Andrea would come, they would call, say that Andrea was coming and visiting and would post pictures. And that just annoyed me, to be honest. I thought, no, you saw a dragonfly because you're on a canoe in July. She's dead. <laughs> Um, can we please stop with all this? And I do remember thinking, maybe if I saw a dragonfly do something different, be somewhere it wouldn't normally be, then maybe I would consider it, but otherwise, who were all the dragonflies before she died? So I was in a really dark place, and this went on for quite a while, um, and I knew I had to do something differently. I have three kids, a great job. I had to get out of the rut I was in. I was stuck. So I went to see a shaman. And this woman is incredible. She knew things about me she couldn't possibly have known if there wasn't something to all of this. So that helped me wake up a little bit to it. And in the course of our discussion, we talked about writing. I'm also a writer and various things. And she invited me to a Koya class. And since I had never heard of Koya, she explained it to me as a combination of yoga, freeform dance, meditation, designed because through movement we remember. And I thought, well, that's 
different, <laughs> and that would really break things up, so I went. And it was called uh, Write Your Soul Story. So I thought, well, if anything, maybe I could learn something more to help with my writing. And by the end of the class, we had each written a short story based on cards we had turned over as writing prompts. And then the unthinkable happened. Betsy Blankenbaker, the instructor, asked us to get in groups of three and share what we had read, or what we had written. And I thought, I don't think so. I don't, I know. I never would have written this had I known we were going to share it, so I'm going to need some more time to write something different. And, and <laughs> Betsy lovingly and wisely said, well, that's why I didn't tell you we were going to share it. <laughs> so reluctantly, and I guess serendipitously, I ended up in a group of three with um, Betsy, the instructor, and Susan Cotter, the shaman who I'd seen that invited me. <laughs> and when it was my turn to read, I fell apart. I was mortified. I hadn't shared some of this stuff with anyone, and now I'm trying to share it with women I didn't even know. And I started sobbing, and not just crying like tears, completely lost my composure. I had snot pouring out of my nose and saliva. I mean, I was a mess. And I kept apologizing. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I couldn't really get the words out. And they just held space for me, just loving, said, it's okay, and handed me a tissue and said, you know, you don't have to feel shame here. Your story's our story. And when I finally finished reading the words, although I'm not sure they understood anything I said, I realized I had released some shame and the blame and the isolation that I was feeling and carrying around in my body on top of the grief of losing my friends and a marriage. And after this class, Betsy invited me and some of the other women to share our stories in a chapter of her next anthology called Autobiographies of Our Orgasms. This is a collection of stories that uh, Betsy compiles as she travels around the world teaching Koya and writing workshops. And it's women sharing how sexual abuse and trauma has impacted their subsequent sexuality. And so I did it. <laughs> and because of this divinely timed soul, I don't know if this was a confession or a purge or what actually happened, and a synchronized encounter, I accomplished one of my life goals, which was to become a published author. And this was the book. I wrote it under a pseudonym, Erica Brooke, because I hadn't shared it with people at the time. And within a few days of me receiving my copies of the books, clicker is not working. <laughs> Can I get the clicker to work? There we go. <laughs> Look who showed up. This perfectly intact, perfectly alive dragonfly was in my car, and my windows had been rolled up, and I hadn't been near water. And so I would like to share that this was a sweet, peaceful moment, but it wasn't. I don't like bugs, and it freaked me out. <laughs> so I got out, I threw all the doors open and got out of the car screaming, oh my God, what do I do? What do I say? This isn't happening, how is this happening? And my poor daughter, she just gotten her permit, so she was trying to get in the driver's side. Said, Mom, what's wrong? I said, it's Andrea. I don't know what to say or do. I don't know how to get her out of the car. <laughs> and so when I finally stopped freaking out, <laughs> realizing it is still just a dragonfly, with goosebumps all over my body and tears in my eyes, I softened to the idea that maybe just maybe my best friend had come to congratulate me on this proud life accomplishment. And it was then I knew I was a recovering skeptic. <laughs> so fast forward <laughs> to May of this year. And I start seeing, I fast forward, not because a lot of really cool things didn't happen over the previous year, but what happened in May really blew my mind. So I start seeing repeating fives, and it's the fifth month. And I guess I'm having fun with numbers again. And early in the month, I went down to visit my grandparents. And I brought my voice recorder in hopes that I could get my grandma's story recorded. Part of what I'm writing, I want firsthand accounts of my family's story, uh, particularly my mother's. My book is called My Three Matriarchs. And she did it. So she started sharing. And she started by saying, I just remember never really feeling loved by my parents growing up. It's like, wow, grandma, <laughs> me too keep talking. This is part of what I'm trying to write about and understand are these family traumas or cycles of abuse or whatever. I, I, please keep going. This is beautiful. And at the age of 85 and failing health, my grandma shared her story and broke her silence. And then Mother's Day rolls around 
when there's another Koya class, this time led by Susan Cotter, the shaman who had originally introduced me to Koya. And she's so wise, she, how beautiful, she called the class that day honoring the life giver. And I knew I had to go because of what I'm writing, and, and that's what I want to do is understand honoring life giver. And that day in the class, my intention, or why I danced, or my prayer, was to heal and release the mother wound. And this was important to me, or is important to me, because I want to understand how to authentically share my story and my journey and honor myself as a life giver while also honoring my life givers and not further traumatizing these women who've already been through so much. The next day, I get a text message from my mom asking if we could hang out. And I thought, well, that was fast. Okay, I was, I was thinking, wow, yes, absolutely we can. And I'm thinking we're going to talk about some of the minor tensions going on between us and maybe some of the stuff I'd written in the chapter I, I published. So she gets to my house the next day at 5 o'clock, of course. <laughs> and we go for a drive. And she proceeds to tell me that she's filing for divorce. I said, okay. I wasn't shocked, given the history, but I was surprised I was surprised about the resolve in my mom's voice and the determination to wake up to the life that she deserved and the love inside of her. And so we were driving and we realized she needed to get gas. So I said, Mom, let me, let me pump you a symbolic tank of gas. She said, what are you talking about? I said, just trust me. So I get out, I let the pump go on its own um, because that's a fun way to play fun with numbers just to see where the gas tank stops. And um, I'm thinking, wow, I can't believe she, you know, this is going on, and how do I wrap my brain around all of this? My logic brain couldn't, couldn't quite get there. Um, and the pump stopped on its own. I don't know if you can see this or not, but it stopped at 3232, which is 55 in numerology, on 515. And I printed a receipt, because I couldn't believe it myself, which printed at 557. So I'm wondering if I started pumping this symbolic tank of gas at 5.55. So I get in the car and I show this to my mom. I'm like, mom, what do you think all these fives are? What's going on? And um, then I said, wait a second. Now that I think about it, it was May 5th, 5.5, when I got grandma's story. I said, like, mom, <laughs> what's going on? And then I said, I haven't even told you I'm auditioning for this walk the talk, signs and synchronicities thing. And just last night, I called it break up and wake up. And now you're telling me you're breaking up and you're waking up to the love inside of you. And she said, what do you think it means? I said, I, I don't know. And then it hit me, five, the fifth chakra, our throat chakra. We're using our voice, speaking our authentic truth. And so I asked my mom, do you care if we go get the voice recorder? Maybe we could get your story recorded too. And she agreed. So we drove around for three more hours sharing about her, childhood and her story, what happened in the marriage, what happened in my childhood. And we broke up our silence, broke up our tensions, and woke up to healing the mother wound. And so as a recovered skeptic, the reason I'm here tonight and my take home message for you is that we're never too old and we're never too late to break up and wake up with signs and synchronicities. Thank you. Erica, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Stay right here. Okay. Uh, by the way, she missed our dress rehearsal. She hadn't been on the stage before, let alone a confetti gun shooting confetti <laughs> over you because her company sent her to Switzerland. So even more amazing what you did tonight. So thank you very much. I think you have a speaking career ahead of you. See? I think you have a speaking career ahead of you. Oh, good. Yeah. Bye-bye. Our third presenter is from Bloomington. We have a strong contingent of B-Town people here tonight, too, I think. But uh, we had a lot of love down at the bus, Kirk Chumley. And she came up to audition. Her story is powerful. Two things that struck both Steve and I on auditions was not only her story, how she came here from Russia. You could almost call it from Russia with love. And yes, she did find her James Bond. It's her husband. He's sitting out there. I've met him but her presence. There was something very special about that. She's a founder 
of Gentle Heart Yoga and Wellness down in Bloomington. I wanted to make sure I get that name right so you can check it out. Gentle Heart Yoga and Wellness down in Bloomington. And so please welcome, with a lot of love, Yulia Ezrael. Hi, everybody. So good to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Very few people understand the heart. The heart is a masterpiece of creation. It has the potential to create frequencies and harmonies that are far beyond of what the human mind is capable of. The heart is the instrument, phenomenal instrument, that made up of very subtle energy that very few people come to appreciate. The heart generates the largest electromagnetic field in the human body and when measured by electrocardiogram, it is actually 60 times greater than the activity created by the brain. Although most human beings, the heart in them works unattended. Even though its behavior governs the course of our lives, it is not understood. The heart is so powerful, this energy, that it attracts our deepest desires to itself. This magnetic pull is so powerful that seemingly impossible events and circumstances align into place at the right time. When, it ha when the heart happens to open, we fall in love, we feel inspired. If at any given point in time the heart happens to close, the love stops. If the heart hurts, we get angry. And if we stop feeling it altogether, we shut down and get empty. These changes that take place in the heart govern the entire course of our lives. These shifts in the energy run our life. Can you think of a time in your life when you feel devastated, angry, frustrated, and your heart felt closed? I used to experience my heart being closed every time, almost every time, I stood in front of people because I was terrified, absolutely terrified, that they would judge me. I kept protecting myself by closing my heart, thinking that I would be safe. In fact, when I was taking a speech class right down the road at IUPY about 18 years ago, I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I was going to go unconscious because I was that scared of them judging me. My brother-in-law, David, he's somewhere here, I believe, saved me from flunking this class because he came up with a brilliant idea about a soup that I love to make from Russia out of beets called borscht. He came up with this line, borscht, it's a meal. <laughs> that line saved me from flunking that class, and I passed with a C plus. <laughs> so how did life redirect me and bring me into this, onto this stage, talking to you about the heart and the signs and synchronicities? The signs and synchronicities are inconceivable to my mind. About 10 years ago, I was on the path pursuing a career in sciences. And I thought I knew what I was doing. It was a PhD in biochemistry. I thought I was in control of my life and knew where I was directing it to go. A successful career developing drugs for diabetes. How did life redirect me into the world of spiritual growth, the heart, and how did I become a yoga teacher and a mentor for spirituality? 
the answer to this question is the truth of my heart brought me here. I want to tell you a personal story that involves a lot of signs and synchronistic forces. About 10 years ago, well, you might have guessed that I am from Russia based on the Russian beet soup story. <laughs> well, maybe my Russian accent gave it away too. <laughs> well, I actually grew up in the Soviet Union behind an iron curtain where the idea of visiting a foreign country was an impossible dream not to mention the possibility of me one day immigrating and living in this country. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, my parents did everything they could to continue providing for the family because their research was no longer subsidized by the government. And we hosted American students, you can see one of them on the right, Sally, and that allowed my parents to save about $500 that's all they had in their savings, and they kept it in the closet in our apartment in Moscow. And right at that time, my mom was approached by a really good friend who invited you, her to come for an organized tour to Europe that involved a trip to Paris. And while, while my mom contemplated and thought about it, her mind said, are you crazy to spend all of our family's savings on a vacation? Her heart felt this pull. She felt that pull and a calling, and she said yes, and embarked on this once-in-a-lifetime journey. So she, here she is, a couple weeks later, on top of an Eiffel Tower, with this magnificent w view of the most romantic city in front of her, and right at that moment, she made a powerful, soul-like connection with a woman who later became her really good friend. And upon their return to Moscow, help her get a job out of all places in American embassy in Moscow. So that single trip to Paris led to another whole sequence of synchronistic events that changed the course of my family's life forever. Because of my mom's... <laughs> That's a sign. <laughs> Because of my mom's knowing about working at the American Embassy, she learned about a program where we could play a lottery and have a chance to win a green card in a lottery. Because my mom knew about this, we started playing. And a couple years later, my sister, who's also here somewhere, won a green card in a lottery. And the next year, my father won a green card in the lottery. The probability of winning a green card was about 1.2%. And I asked my dad to help me calculate the probability of two green card win winners in one family. It's really close to zero, 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 one. And I want to tell you the chances of me getting into this country were even slimmer. The year when my father won a green card in this lottery, I was turning 21 years old. And according to the law, once you're 21, you're no longer considered part of the family, dependent of the family. And I would have been left behind. The interview at the embassy was scheduled a month after my 21st birthday. And by chance, and my mom's charming ways with the counselor of the embassy, <laughs> Another one. Another sign. <laughs> By my mom's charming ways with the counselor at the embassy, the interview was shifted a whole month earlier. And my dad and I crossed the border and came to the New York City two weeks before my 21st birthday. <laughs> I still feel the chill, chills about how small that window was and how many synchronistic forces were at work to make all of this to be orchestrated that perfectly. Over the last 18 years of living in this country, a lot of internal shifts and transformation took place that was governed by my heart and a lot of synchronistic forces. About 
like I said, uh, 10 years ago, I was pursuing a science degree. And after completing the bachelor's degree here at IUPUI, thanks to my brother-in-law, David, I was on a path to continue pursuing their career in sciences, following my parents' footsteps. I took a GRE exam and sent the score to three universities automatically. And then I forgot where I sent them. About a month later, I receive a letter from the biochemistry program in Bloomington saying that they received the score, but no application form. They invited me to come for an open house. They offered to waive the fee, application fee, and they even set me up for a hotel stay for the whole weekend while I was visiting college. I remember that feeling that I had while I was visiting, that feeling of a pool, the magnetic pool in my heart, and I said, yes. Over the first three years of being part of the biochemistry program in Bloomington, I didn't know the world outside of the lab and my apartment. That path that I crossed over and over, I didn't know anything else existed in Bloomington. And I felt pretty alone, and I felt like that I didn't really belong there. I felt insec deeply insecure. And that feeling of insecurity was not new to me. Growing up in the Soviet Russia as a Jewish kid, I felt alone and insecure and that there was something deeply wrong with me all the time. I felt like a stranger in the strange land. And back in the Bloomington times, so one day I'm walking from my apartment to the lab and I see a marquee sign on the union building that says, Argentine Tango, free class. And I remember seeing that sign and feeling that pull, energetic pull towards it. And I followed the sign. I walk into the room, and here's a guy who I met right away named Pablo, who started quickly teaching me how to dance tango. <laughs> And I, here I am, started to slowly come to life and thaw out. I started feeling alive again. I started feeling. And I felt that inspiration, the love in my heart. And he also later told me that there is a house in Bloomington where we can learn to do yoga. And I said, yes, let's do it. That calling for yoga and dance didn't make any sense for my PhD career. And that year was the year of my qualifying exams. That means that if I didn't pass them, I would have not been able to continue. So that entire year of my qualifying exams, I spent most of my time dancing tango all over the country in Mexico and practicing yoga five times a week for three hours. Even though it didn't make any sense, I felt so alive that I've never felt before. And I followed this feeling in my heart to continue. I flunked the qualifying exams. <laughs> and that was it to my PhD and science career. I continued listening and I went, I had this strong feeling that I wanted to go deeper into the spiritual practice of yoga. And I went to Florida to study with a world-renowned yoga master. And I became a yoga teacher. I remember for the very first time during that teacher's training, knowing in the depth of my being that there was absolutely nothing wrong with this. Nothing wrong with me. I remember I reconnected back to my, the depth of my being. I came home to myself. I felt so alive and so deeply at peace that I've never felt before. I knew that all those signs, all those step footprints that I followed that got me into that place, I was practicing yoga all along the way. I just didn't know. I was listening to my heart. And I remember at that time when I just knew with the depth of my being that I was the divine child, just like every one of you.
as I look back at all those miracles that took place in my life, in my family's life, I see three common threads. The first one is that it didn't make any sense to our minds what we did. For my mom to take that frivolous trip to Paris and spend all of our family's savings was insane. For me to follow my heart and dance tango and practice yoga during the most important year of my science career was pretty insane. And even though our mind said, are you crazy? There was something unmistakably real that we felt in our hearts and we trusted that feeling. And the third thread is not only we trusted it, we also took the steps and did the follow through. We followed it. We trusted and we did something with it. Some of you might be thinking, well, your family is just darn lucky. All that luck, how could that happen? How does it relate to me? And I want to tell you that this condition of being in alignment and listening and trusting your heart creates enormous amount of luck in your life. Even in the midst of uncertainties and fears, when we attune to this phenomenal instrument that we all have, we become magicians. We turn difficulties and challenges and uncertainties and fears into opportunities, growth, and expansion. So I want to ask you now, if there is something in your life that perhaps your heart has been whispering you, to you about, but perhaps you haven't fully given it a chance to be heard, trusted, and acted upon. Is there something in your life perhaps you've been wanting to create or have a change or follow your heart and take up an instrument or a drawing class or art or travel or change a career? Perhaps there's been something that your heart been telling you. So this is the sign. This is the sign right now for you to listen, to tune in and to trust and follow your precious instrument that's been with you ever since you've been born. Can you hear it? Thank you so much. <laughs> Yulia Azrael, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, stay here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for auditioning for Walk the Talk. And it's been a joy to have you part of the tribe now and for sharing your story today. Also, not all of you probably got programs, but why don't you share your website for the Yoga and Wellness Center down in Bloomington? Thank you. It's gentleheartwellness.com. Yeah, and there is a gift there. If anybody wants to go, you'll receive a gift when you come to the website. All right, thank you so thank much. You. Gentle heart. Uh. <laughs> Our next presenter has been on stage before at the Vogue for Walk the Talk. I remember that audition to this day because she was so funny and then wove into this profound statement that it captivated us, and she rocked it that night. You're going to see, for those of you who saw her last time, a more vulnerable side of her tonight. For years, she was a school teacher, school corporation, locally here, through signs and synchronicities, and it was time to leave. Now she's teaching by being a facilitator in a numerous uh, not-for-profits here in Indianapolis. But some of you might know her because she's also been an actress in many community productions here in the Indianapolis area. Please welcome to the stage, Margie Worrell. Can we 
to give a little love to the Walk the Talk band. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, guys, I am so grateful to be with you here tonight. Um, when I told my friends and acquaintances that I was going to be doing a talk on signs and synchronicities, I generally got one of two responses. Over in this camp were my friends that went, cool, awesome, that's a great topic, I can't wait to hear it. And then over here, on this end of the spectrum, were my friends that went, wait, hold up a second. You're doing a talk about signs and synchro what? I mean, I don't even know what that means. So uh, tonight, um, I think what I'm gonna do to help out my friends on this end of the spectrum in this camp, I'm gonna talk before I begin a little bit about what those words mean. So let's look at signs and synchronicities. A sign is an occurrence or an object that seems to point to something. We all see signs every day, right? You're driving down the road, you see signs. They help you know how to proceed. They help you know which way to go as you go forward. It's pretty much the same thing with signs on a deeper level. They are guideposts. They are things that help us know how to proceed forward in our lives. Um, for a lot of people, the sign may look very mundane, but because of the way it's experienced by us personally, it can carry great significance. Now, synchronicities actually are two separate events that are causally unrelated, but because of the way they're experienced, they carry great significance and meaning. So for example, maybe you wake up one morning and on a whim, you decide to drive a different way to work. And you get to work and find out that there was a major accident on your regular route. Your decision to drive a different way and the accident were unrelated but because of the way they were experienced, they carry great significance to you. Okay, so that's synchronicities. You may be wondering, um, where do I stand on this continuum, on this spectrum? Well, that's what I plan to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes or so, is my journey through my belief in signs and synchronicities. So let's start back at the very beginning I was raised in a Baptist household, and in that household, I was taught that God was always watching us. God was everywhere. God was always there judging. It's kind of like a benevolent overlord who could strike you down with lightning at any time. So as you can imagine, I was very aware of the decisions I made and the consequences that might ensue. I mean, after all, how embarrassing would that be? You know, like, oh, sorry for that charred crater over there. It turns out God really didn't like that cuss word I just used. So <laughs> I was always looking for signs that what I was doing was okay and acceptable. Well, one day in Sunday school class, I got a wonderful tool presented to me by my teacher. How many of you know the story of Gideon from the Old Testament? Okay, I'm gonna give you the Reader's Digest condensed version, okay? This is the version according to me. All right, so Gideon was getting ready to go into battle. There was a lot of that in the Old Testament. And he said to God, God, I wanna know if my army is gonna win. So he said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lay a fleece out on the threshing room floor and in the morning when I wake up, if the fleece is dry and the ground around it is wet, I'll know that's a sign from you that our armies are gonna be victorious. So Gideon goes to sleep, he wakes up, fleece is dry, ground is wet, yay, his army's gonna win, he's so excited. No, he's not, he's not excited, mm -mm. Because Gideon was a little bit of a doubting Thomas, another biblical reference there for you. Um, so he said, okay God, cool dude, I like that, that was really neat, but this time, I'm gonna ask you to do it again, but I want the fleece to be wet and the ground around it to be dry. So he went to sleep, got up the next morning, fleece was wet, ground was dry, yay, his army's gonna win. Okay, I'm not sure what lesson the Sunday school teacher wanted me to take away from this, but I thought I had hit the jackpot. I finally knew what I could do. I would start asking God for signs. I mean, after all, it was all right there. The key points from that lesson were this. Number one, God could do really cool things with morning dew and lamb's wool. Number two, 
God would tolerate a certain amount of cheekiness from people asking for signs. And number three, God could control the world around me to tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing. Ah, bingo, that was it. I would lay out a fleece for God religiously. I asked for all kinds of things, major things, minor things. I even remember getting ready to go to school for the instrument try-on when you get to figure out what instrument you're going to play in band. I said, God, when I wake up in the morning, if there are clouds in the sky, I should play the oboe. If there are no clouds, I should play the clarinet. I woke up, it was a clear day, and I ended up playing clarinet. What do you know? So it, that was great. And it worked out well. I actually enjoyed the clarinet quite a bit. Um, but I tell you this story because I want you to understand that at that point in my life, I really did believe that God interacted with us personally, and I believed in signs. But let's fast forward a little bit. As I got ready to go to college, I started to hang out with some more intellectual types. These were people that required hard, cold facts and evidence in order to support any belief. And I wasn't about to share with them my belief in signs. In fact, I started to doubt that belief system altogether. I started to think maybe that was just childish imaginings. And I started to think maybe God didn't interact with us on a personal level. I even started to doubt if God existed at all. So I decided at that point in my life to just cut off my spiritual self. There was a problem with that. I consider us all to be spiritual beings at heart. And when we cut off our spiritual self, it's like cutting off a body part and expecting to function in a normal way. So when I did this, I created a void inside of me that I didn't understand and that I couldn't fill. And this void became greater as time went on. You see, I graduated from college, I, I got married, I had kids, I became a teacher, and a lot of things in my life started to pile in on that void. Things like self-doubt, anxiety, depression. All of these things kind of rolled into the void and made it larger and greater. I started to f experience a lot of pain until the void inside of me became more like a black hole. It kind of sucked all life around into it and I didn't have a coping mechanism. I didn't have a spiritual path to help me figure out how to fill that hole, fill that void inside of me. So I looked for a coping mechanism to help ease that pain and I found one and it was alcohol. You see, alcohol helped numb the pain for a little while. It helped me to be able to cope with the fact that I felt empty a lot of the time. But as with many coping mechanisms, it was not very helpful, and the cure soon became the disease. As time passed, alcohol went from being my friend and my solace to my enemy and my destruction. I hit a point in 2014 where I could no longer continue to drink because that was creating pain inside of me, but I couldn't not drink because of the pain inside of me, and I knew I needed help. So on July 14th, 2014, I decided to attend my very first AA meeting. As I walked up to that building, and I looked around at the people who were coming into this meeting with me, I thought, I am in the wrong place. I am not supposed to be here. I was pretty sure that this all was very, very wrong, and I was ready to turn on my heel and go back to my car when this still small voice inside of me said, you need to go in and take a seat. And I did, and I thank God that I did. Because when I got into those, that room and I sat down, those people that I had been judging on the way in were welcoming and loving. They were joyous. They shook my hand and hugged me. They said things to me like, we will love you until you can learn to love yourself and keep coming back. And in that moment, I suddenly realized for the first time I was exactly where I needed to be. I understood what people meant when they said God had led them somewhere because I had been led to this moment. 
in that moment, I was able to open up. I was able to be everything I was intended to be. And when I uttered the words, hello, my name is Margie and I'm an alcoholic, I realized my life would change forever. You see, in opening up, I suddenly realized that I had been looking at life as though through a telescope, only seeing a small part, not really being able to see the entire picture. But in opening my heart, I suddenly became aware. I was suddenly able to see and notice small signs around me. Uh, one of the first signs that I noticed was that I needed to leave teaching. I had been a teacher for many years. I had been very successful as a teacher and all logical signs pointed to the fact that I should just stay with teaching. And in fact, I could count on my hand the number of people that supported me in this choice to leave teaching and I would still have fingers left over. But those voices did not matter to me. The only voice that mattered to me was the voice inside my heart, the voice that I now knew would lead me in the right direction. And so I did leave teaching, and it was the best decision for my sanity and for my sobriety. And since then, I have had two amazing careers where I've learned so much that I never would have been a part of or been able to learn from had I not listened to that voice. The next sign um, that I received actually was a sign. Um, I dropped my son off at drum lessons like I always did, and I took my laptop to Starbucks like I always did, and I ended up at the table I hate the most, the one right by the bulletin board. Ugh, I never got that table, I never liked that table. So I thought, fine, whatever, I just open up my laptop and I start working. And all of a sudden I thought, I should look at the bulletin board. I, I have this feeling I should look at the bulletin board, and I look at it. And there's posters there, it's all cluttered. You've seen the Starbucks bulletin boards. And I, there's one that stands out though, it says, listen to your mother. And I thought, wow, that's good advice. I wish someone would tell my kids that, that would be really nice. <laughs> and I go back to typing away on my computer, but I, I felt that voice inside me, again, kind of tugging at me. And it said, read a little bit more. So I read a little bit more on the poster and it was calling for submissions of original works on motherhood. And I thought, I'm supposed to write a story on motherhood. And the voice was like, yeah, how about that? So I started typing. I didn't do my work, I just pushed that right aside and I started typing. This story flowed out of me like water. I understood what people talk about when they say they felt inspired. It, it, I called this story Lessons from Motherhood and it was all about the lessons that my two beautiful children had taught me about living life to its fullest. I finished it, I read through it one time, and I submitted it without letting anyone else look at it. <laughs> I never did that, I would never do that, but I did. And I thought, well, that's it, <laughs> I'm done, that's not gonna go anywhere. But what do you know? I was actually honored to be a part of that show, and I met the most amazing people, and I got to be able to share in their stories as well and hear more about some amazing stories on motherhood. The last story I want to share with you actually is a story about synchronicity, and it has to do with the Walk the Talk series. Now, some of you are already going to know the end of this story if you came to the last talk, so bear with me. Um, but you don't know the beginning of it. I'm going to share that part with you now. I was on Facebook, as I often am, way too often, and I was flipping through, and I saw this cute poster of this little dog meditating. It was so adorable, I just kept flipping, you know. And all of a sudden that voice said, go back to that, look at that. So I flip back and I'm like, yeah, it's on mindfulness. Mindfulness. Hey, wait, that's what I've been working on in my AA program. I'm trying to work on mindfulness. So I read a little bit more. As it turned out, they were calling for people to audition to present stories on mindfulness. And I thought, well, how cool is that? That's really awesome. So I reached out to Stephen Ross and I was like, hey, I want to audition. And he said, well, too bad, because all the audition slots are filled. Maybe you can audition for the next show. I was like, okay, fine. That obviously was a false alarm. Okay, good. Half an hour later, Steve reaches back out to me and says, you must be really good at manifesting because someone just called and canceled their audition. Would you be interested in taking the slot? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I think I can take the slot. Those of you that were at the show on mindfulness know the end of this story. I got to be a part of that show as well. 
And again, it was a growing experience. It's like the little voice inside of me said, come on, let's go do something, let's grow some more. The more I listen to that voice, the more that I can pay attention to it, the more I grow. So I would encourage you, if you can, open up your heart. Pay attention to that little voice inside you. I mean, he's the one who should have this microphone. You've got to listen to that voice inside of your heart. And for those of you who are living over here in this camp, that's cool. No worries. I think that's awesome. But I would encourage you to maybe think a little bit differently about signs and synchronicities. I mean, after all, signs and synchronicities don't have to come from God or a higher power. I think we live in this world around us for a reason. This world can give us signs. This world can present us with synchronicities. I mean, after all, the world acts upon us as we act upon it. Thank you. Margie Worrell. Thank you for being vulnerable tonight, for sharing your story. I've known you a little bit since the first time, and when you started sharing about that path to sobriety, I thought about a lot of people that I know. Um, we all are dealing with something, and I thought, wow, what courage that was to share that in front of 350 people here in the room, these beautiful people right here. It's something we greatly need more of in our society, and it's always a joy to have you part of the tribe. So thank you so very much. Thank you. All I right. appreciate Blessings. it. Blessings. Uh -huh. Our next presenter has also presented before. His, oh, by the way, uh, we have a YouTube channel. All the talks that have been done over the last two years are all posted on there, Walk the Talk, or walkthetalkseries.com. Steve will correct me on that towards the end. But his talk was on there, and he got thousands of hits. He is a successful entrepreneur. He started a wind turbine uh, business down in South America to help the indigenous people. He was in South America for 10 years. We're grateful that he came back to Indianapolis. He's also a realtor. What I think is a real hood, he's also a Uber driver and has lots of stories. Maybe some of you had him as your driver, but let me say this. My youngest son, Sam, once told me, Dad, the greatest compliment you can pay to another dude is to say, he's a good man. With all my heart, this next presenter is a good man. Please show this good man a lot of love. Kevin Michael Verkamp. Oh, there it goes. Hi, how you doing tonight? It is, it is so fun to, to be back up here again but especially with this topic, because it really was something that rang with me. It was something like just when I heard this, I'm like, yeah, I got to audition for that one. Because I believe that it's synchronicity is something that is 100% of your existence. Everything that happens, I believe, is because of what you're synchronized with and, and the frequency of your synchronization. Now, what's really cool is that in this room, right, Everybody that's here tonight is here because they were synchronized with the concept of being here. You heard about this, or somebody told you about it, or somebody bought you tickets, but you came, right? And it was somehow it resonated with you, and you came here this evening. And so that shows that you're on the right path, in my opinion. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the, there it goes. Because in my opinion, the frequency, if you look at it like the band of, of frequencies, okay? You have very low frequencies and very high frequencies. Now I chose a couple world leaders, okay? I could have used a more current world leader, right? But I didn't want to create any problems tonight. The, um, but, but for me, it's really important to understand that both of these men were very talented, right? I mean, that's the truth. They're both very talented, but you had one that was all about hate and selfishness, right? I get very emotional. <laughs> you have another one who's full of love and compassion, right? 
and did incredibly great things, and another man who did horrible things, and basically the same time frame in history. So you can decide where on this band do you want to be, okay? I want to be Gandhi. That's me, right? I want to be Buddha. That's my goal. If you want to know, that's my goal. I want to be Buddha. The, but you look again at the frequency, and there's the visual spectrum in the middle, and I think that's where most of us exist, all right? And thank God for that, that most of us don't exist in that very low frequency, right? But we do run into that, right? And that high frequency, you know it when you meet somebody, right? And you just know it. My mother, where is she? Hi, Mom. You know, my mother's one of those people. You know, and I talked about that last time, too. Everywhere I go, it's like, oh, my God, your mother is the greatest, you know? Oh, you're a Verkamp. Are you ethnic? Boy? Oh, I just love your mother. The, um, it, it just, but again, you know it when you meet these people, right? So part of my thought is, again, on, on how to become that person, right? How do you, where do I aim this thing? There we go. <laughs> how do you get there? So, and for me, again, a big, big part of this is social media right? Because our resonance, our frequency resonates in social media. So if you are a negative person, like, let me not put it that way, if you're a low frequency person, okay, then that's, gonna, that's what's going to resonate because Facebook knows you're a low frequency person, all right, and they're going to feed you more of that because that's what you like, okay? That's what rings true to you, even if it's not, right? There are many hate groups on Facebook, right? There are also many love groups on Facebook. Walk the Talk has a page on Facebook, okay? That's a good one. When you react to things, you get more of that. So if you're reacting to things, even if they're negative things, you're going to get more of that. You're going to feel more negative about the world, and you're going to start, again, carrying that low frequency with you. So it's really important to consider with your social media, unfollow, okay? Cut the dead wood, all right? Reach up, not down. What does that mean? You see something cool, walk the talk, right? You follow it. You like the page, all right? If you see negative things coming through your feed, unfollow. You don't need it. It's not doing you any good. It's keeping your frequency low. Now, in my case, I escaped social media, okay? I escaped all media. Um, as, as he mentioned, I moved to Peru about 12 years ago. And when I did move to Peru, all of a sudden there was just silence and calm, right? I didn't have TV, right? And when I was on TV, I didn't understand anyway, right? It was in Spanish, so it wasn't very entertaining. And, but that was a wonderful thing because it let me be calm. Now, the other side of that, as you mentioned, I, I started an organization that was trying to alleviate energy poverty. So that took me into these villages where there was no electricity, all right? If you can imagine never having electricity in your life, these were the happiest people in the world. I mean, incredibly happy. And I, I chose this photo because of the kids, right? And you can see how happy they are. You can also tell that they, don't, that, that they appear what we would call poor. Okay, but that I would say they're probably the wealthiest kids out there, all right, because they have time, they have human connection, they have love, they're having fun all the time. But my favorite thing in this picture was this boy right here, and I didn't even realize it when I chose the picture. He has one shoe on. And look how happy he is. Can you imagine if I walked out here on stage with one shoe? Hi, guys, you know? It's, it's amazing, but it really helped me, again, to, to calm and to see, and to see a different perspective. And that's what I encourage all of you to do as you hear all of the speakers this evening. Try to take that perspective and figure out why are we all so happy? You know, we're, I mean, this is, again, it's amazing to me. Again, what a group of love this is. Still haven't figured this thing out. So anyway, so there's my organization. So again, back to resonance, back to frequency. When I moved to Peru, again, I felt like I was on, on this path of a higher frequency. What I found was that that attracted people, right? They were also resonating at a higher frequency. So engineers would come from all over the world and they would volunteer their time and money, right? To participate in this and build a wind generator for a school that doesn't have electricity or for a community that doesn't have electricity. They would, I mean, it was just amazing to me, but again, this, this resonance right, also came back to me. I became a better person with each one of them that came because I felt like I had to live up to what they thought of me. So this grew and it went on and I spent about eight years doing this. Um, we've had about 350, well now probably about 400 engineers, you can imagine, it would fill this room that have come and it's still, again, biggest group ever is actually there in Peru right now. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> 
That's... But I want to emphasize, again, it wasn't me. It's the residents, right? So as in the last, what happened is that some people came that were real serious, and they stayed. Okay, one guy, he came for two months. He was, has a master's in engineering from Virginia. You're my young guy, right, in his 20s. And he comes, and two months later, he goes, I want to stay. That's what happened to me when I went. I was going for six months, right? And at that point, I'd been there for about seven years. So, yeah, it happens, you know. Sorry, Mom, I'm back, okay? The, um, so he comes, and he's like, you know what? This is awesome. I want to stay, you know? And I'm like, you know, I'd been looking for somebody to be a director that was a younger, that was younger, had a little bit more energy than me, and all of that. And that also freed me up as he took responsibility, and the other two, Jessica and Ross, they took responsibility. And I started to, to sort of get involved in shamanism in Peru. It raised my, it piqued my interest. So I started to look at that. Now that was an important, very important process for me because it showed me again my highest frequency. All right, I'm not at that highest frequency right now, but it showed me the connectivity that I have with every living being, with every one of you in the room tonight. You know, when I say brother to my friends, I'm not saying, I, I, I mean that, okay? They, you know, we are all connected everything we're all breathing the same air tonight you know think about that the same air all right the same water that runs through the river we are connected to every single thing so this was an important part of my journey now there's other ways to get there right there's meditation some people find it in their church you know you'll find it on whatever your path is you'll find it but again you got to seek those higher frequencies I'm gonna run over my time, but I'm gonna blame this, okay? The, so anyway, so about two years ago, well, two and a half years ago, decided it was time to move back to the United States. Now, the hippie sitting there in front of the cool building, that's me, right? The guy, uh, the other guy, is the realtor that I wanna become here in the United States, right? Huge transition. And I'm also thinking I'm coming back again, high frequency, right? And I'm coming back and I'm thinking, oh, the United States, right? I mean, it was, that's what I was thinking. So I talked to a friend of mine and he's an Uber driver, right, in Seattle. And he tells me, man, you gotta do Uber. And I literally said, what's Uber? I had no idea. So he explained it to me and I'm like, that sounds fun. I'll be able to get to know the neighborhoods. I'll get to meet people. So I come back, right, get a car, sign up for Uber. I have had 10,000 riders in my car in the last two years. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I only drive on weekends, the um, busy weekends. No, but it is, it is amazing to me. And again, it gave me the opportunity to sort of, again, adjust and figure out my frequency and their frequency. Same thing, reach up, not down, right? I've met amazing people. Right? And I have learned incredible stories. One of my favorites, a very simple one, a guy had an empty cup. And I said, that's a terrible way to start the night. And he said, man, he said, that's my cup of hope. I'll never forget it. My cup of hope. I will never have an empty glass again. So another story is that one night I'm driving, I get a Lux call, and I go and pick up this guy. Hi, my name's Steve, my son Chris, super nice, driving down. They're going downtown, and he explains on his phone to his wife that he had a flat tire, so he had to take an Uber, right? So I hear the story, and after I got done on the phone, I said, sir, I'll tell you what, I'll pick up a can of fix a flat, all right? And I'll give you a ride back home after the game. He's, he's about 70 years old. I said, and I can help you out with your tire, right? So anyway, so of course, they go to the game, I get the fix a flat, I pick the guy back up, and I drive him home, and as we're going to his house, I said, you know, again, sir, I'd be glad to come in and help you do your tire, and especially didn't have his son with him. And he said, you know what? I said, that'd be great. Now, I'm skipping part of this story because when I said I'd buy the can of fix a flat, he said, how much is it? And I said, I don't know, probably $5, don't worry about it. He said, no, 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 I insist. So he puts $20 on the center thing. I'm like, cool. So anyway, so make a long story short, when I bought the fix a flat, I realized he'd give me $80, all right? So I knew that I had done the right thing. That was the universe, thank you, universe. Because I was offering to help, right? and I was rewarded for that. So I take the man to his house, and I fix his tire while the compressor is running. He invites me into his house. Now, how many of you would invite the anonymous Uber driver into your homes, <laughs> right? 
And this isn't just any house. This is about a 16,000 square foot house. Now remember, I'm a realtor, right? So I know this. So, so he takes me in and he shows me around and he shows me in the study this beautiful oil painting, right, of a horse. And he said, that's Tommy Sue's delight. Now his name is Steve and her name is Tommy Sue. Most of you can probably figure out who I was driving that night. Now I have to say I ended up driving them the next weekend as well um, to an event. But the point being, again, resonance, right? Because I put myself out there, right? He put himself out there, invited me into his home, and made friends with me. And I thought it was, again, really significant because also, if you had told me to have lunch with that gentleman tomorrow, I would not have based on the stories I'd heard in the media, right? But they, were, they are incredible, nice people. But anyway, there's another 9,998 stories that I don't have time to tell you. But I have to say it's been a wonderful experience, and I do wonder if I have any, any writers in, in the room tonight. Part of my, again, my frequency, when you get in my car, all right, you'll see I have a Buddha that sits up there by the radio, right? So immediately you know, right, oh yeah, he's one of the new age guys, right? Starts conversation. All right, it's, it's small, but it's, it's again, a strong hint. I also have the walk the talk sticker on the back. So, of course, occasionally, generally it's people who are, again, a little higher frequency, they'll say, oh, what's walk the talk? That sounds cool. And, you know, I got them then, they're in the car, right? They gotta listen to me for 15 minutes. <laughs> so, I have practiced this speech on 9,000 riders in my car. But the point being, again, put the signals out there too. Always be reaching higher, always looking for that conversation, looking for that connection, right, with people who are going to help elevate your thinking. And again, I like to think I'm the one with the colored brain, just so you know, which one's me. But another part of this, again, has been eye contact, right? I get out of the car, I open the door, right, for them, and they get in the car, right? Now, why do I do that? Eye contact. All right, I want to look them in the eye. I want to make that connection so we can have a real conversation. And if all they see is the back of my head, my gray hair, they're probably not going to have that conversation. But I think it's so important, again, to connect with people, right? Now, you might be that colorful brain, brain and they might be the blue one, right? But you might be the blue one, and they might be the color, colorful brain as well. So a lot of times there's an opportunity to learn from people, like the man with a cup of hope, that will really, really just change your day. Highest frequency is so simple, it's love. Again, love and compassion, as I said in the beginning, right? Lowest frequency, hate and selfishness. If you find yourself thinking in a hateful or selfish way, hating anybody, anything, even the people that you think you should hate, all right, go back to the other side. Find the compassion. Understand that they might not be in their journey, right, where you are today right? But help them get there, that one little step, that one little step. Raise their frequency, right? But most importantly, raise your own, because it's the only way that you will resonate like a singing bowl and have a room of 400 people that want to make the world a better place and make an epic change. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, there it is. So keep calm, raise your vibration. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. Kevin Michael yeah. Verkamp. <laughs> I'll take that, sir. Let me ask I, are I you. I was trying to escape. You were. <laughs> are you still doing Uber? I am. I am. Um, I'm not doing anything this weekend. I might call you. You can pick me up. Or just drive around. Absolutely. Seinfeld has his comedians in a car having coffee. It can be two walk the talk guys <laughs> in a car having coffee. Thank you for another great presentation. Thank you. Blessings so to you. Much. Okay. Can I appreciate All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter, and I'm going to try to do this without crying. I've known her since 2006. She's always been there for me, so many levels. When I launched Journeys Fire International, the 501c3, she was our graphic artist. She is a successful graphic artist. She helped me with a lot of the teachers that I brought here to Indianapolis. But the side of her that I've really appreciated is that non-denominational minister side. She knows things. Yeah, 
<laughs> when I thought of signs and synchronicities, I thought of her because of her God Signs Institute. Okay. Now we're having a party. All right, we had to wait for now. The inner path table, they got to calm down down there. <laughs> But here's what I love the most about her. She's also an accomplished author. I've read both of her books. A plug for her. But no matter who she's with, she always treats them with kindness and love, and she always says, thank you for the work that you do in the world. It's with great joy and honor that I welcome Annie Truesdale to the stage. band tonight. Thank you. How incredibly special are they? Thank you guys very much. Deep breath. What if you knew life spoke to you every day without fail in order to get you in sync with life? And life used anything in any given moment surrounding you to bring you answers to your questions, solutions to your problems, warnings, send you love. Sometimes to just go, hi, have a nice day. And all you needed to do to see these answers, use the solutions, heed the warnings, embrace the love, was to pay attention and connect the dots. And the dots are your signs, synchronicities, Coincidences, numbers, colors, words, animals, music that surround you in any given moment. Is life that in sync with you? Yes. Are you that in sync with life? We say it's just a coincidence, a mere happenstance, as if events that happen in your life that can take your breath away or if you've heard tonight change your life or give you direction is just. Those coincidences, those synchronicities, that's life speaking to you. And when life is speaking to you, that is profound. That's not a just, that's profound and it's a positive find. Numbers are used by life to speak to you. Numbers already speak to you. If I say to you 911, 911. If I say it a third time, some of you will start reaching for your phones and you'll look around to see who's going to call. If I say to you 911, 911, that's a very different thing. And yet it uses the same numbers a nine and two ones. 24 7, 24 7. You know what I mean? 1 800. 1-800-blah-blah-blah. We took the infinity symbol and we stood it on its head and we go, okay, you mean $8. If I put two dots in there, it can mean time. Infinite possibilities in eights. We got some eights out there. Do we have any Shriners out there, any Masonic Lodge brothers? any Freemasons, because I would like to thank you all very, very much for the wonderful work you do all over our world. Think about the children and the families by the millions that have been helped by Shriners Hospitals. And the Freemasons will tell you how source, life, creator, the grand architect, uses numbers to speak to us on a regular basis, because it is in the math. 11s, 22s, 33s, multiple 4s, multiple 5s. They worked very hard to get to the 33rd degree. George Washington was a 33rd degree Mason, as were many of our presidents. And the Freemasons were responsible for building the Washington Monument to honor all that. And it is built 555 feet exactly and on purpose. 
One of the reasons it is 555 feet is because 555 in many areas of the world is known as Christ consciousness. It is an anointed level consciousness. Now that can be Jesus Christ consciousness. It can also be Buddha consciousness, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. consciousness. And when you start seeing 555, you have some big help that's showing up around you. Now, if we take a section of that, if we just take the 55, then you have a mastery number of security, protection, guidance, direction. Many of you have driven by them today, but you don't necessarily realize that number is there to help protect you when you are your most vulnerable, when it can be the most dangerous for us because so few people can actually drive 55. I am here to tell you if that song starts playing in your head and it comes over the radio and you're not driving 55 and you should be, life is using it to say, police ahead, you wanna slow down a little bit, test that and see what happens. Here are the numbers that many people see on a regular basis. I get asked about the most. There we go. We got a lot of people seeing 10 tens, 11 elevens. Now I know tonight this is a very positive room with very positive people, so none of you are worriers. <laughs> you aren't, right? But all of you know somebody who's a worrier. 10 has been a number of perfection long before Bo Derek made it so. And if you are worrying about something and 10 10 start showing up, that's life going, you got this. Stop worrying. You're okay. If you were born on 10 10, then that's life talking to you. Because life will use your birthdays to say, I'm over here. Pay attention. We have many computer gurus out there tonight. I want to thank you all too, very much for all you do. They will tell you that computers now run the world. And there aren't many people in this room that will argue with that. They will also tell you the base language for the computers are zeros and ones. It's a binary language. So the zeros and ones, they run the computers. This is a computer. And life knows it and realizes that if you start seeing numbers, it's going to start registering inside your computer. And 1111 is a double mastery number. It is life that's saying we're going to a new level, you're going to a new level. It can be about a relationship, it can be about your job, it can be about yourself. But those 11s create doorways and you've already walked through them and life just wants you to know you've got this, it's okay. And so 11, 11 and 10s and 10s are used. Now many of you also have music that plays in your head. You might wake up with it or it might show up for no particular reason at lunchtime. It might follow you around some days. The music is life bringing you lyrics to get your attention, to bring you an answer, to show you a solution, to go, uh-uh, don't wanna go that way. And life will use anything from Led Zeppelin to Beyonce to Imagine Dragons to say, look at it this way. Because the words matter. I want you to imagine, just for a minute, if you can, the millions, if not billions of people that have been helped, lifted up, lightened up, given hope on this planet from John Lennon's Imagine. I wish I had the time here to tell you just a couple of the many stories that I could relate about Paul's Let It Be. There will be an answer. Let it be. Thank you, Mother Mary. Because the words matter. The words we use matter. We're walking around right now in a society where it doesn't act like words much matter. That's very dangerous because that is not the truth. Here's some words that matter in your life very much. All of you know somebody out there who on a regular basis says, I'm always losing my keys. Or I'm always late. Guess what they get to keep doing until they stop saying it? Some of you may go around going, I'm always losing my phone. You don't want to say that. 
Because guess what you get to keep doing? A few takers out there. This is the word here that gives you the reason why, and it describes the physics of it. If it's your birthday, and I bring you a present, you like it, you'll say thank you very much, and I'm very glad to give you one. But before I've given you your present, I've shopped for it, I've picked it out, I've wrapped it, I've paid for it. Anymore, all I need to do is go click, click, click. Yep, that's what I want right there. Click, 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 and it's brought to me because computers run the world. This moment right now, in this present moment right now, you are bringing all of us speakers a gift. And you're bringing us a gift by your presence here. And it is an incredibly powerful and priceless gift. And the gift we hope to give you is the gift of our words and our stories and our experiences to help lift up, to help ins inspire, because that is the power of the words. And if we are walking around thinking positive, acting positive, being positive, which is what this group is doing right now from all those fabulous speakers and this incredible evening, then we are generating an energy of positive nature individually and collectively. And that positive energy that we are generating here is used by life to bring positive out into our world. And in this present moment, the energy we are generating out is present out into the future. Life presends it out there, and that's what life uses to bring it back. There are many books out about the power of now. There are movies, there are songs. This word explains why. In this present moment, if I am always losing my keys, I am always late, I am always losing my phone, I am generating an energy of loss. Life is using that, it's preset. I've just sent it out into my future. If I stop saying it, if I stop thinking it, then life doesn't have the energy. I haven't presented out to my future in this present moment. The power of now is to remember that in every moment, what are you sending out? And it's in that word. Now, here's some ideas around us that are around us all the time that ties it all together. We are here in Indianapolis. And there are some awesome people in this place in Indianapolis right now. Give it up for Indianapolis. Great city, great town, great place to live. And we are known here all over the world for something we just celebrated in May, which is called the 500. There's another number that you can use, and there's all kinds of ideas about that. The kids here could write me a paper on the 500. And they tell you there are 33 drivers in 11 rows trying to go as fast as they possibly can. And they come to Indianapolis because one of the main things that help grow this town is our love of horsepower. The men will go, how much horsepower you got under that hood? Because we'll get you more. And they come from all over the world for the expertise here about our horsepower because we like to go zoom, zoom. Back in the mid-80s, infinite possibilities in the 80s, the powers that be decided the city was big enough for another professional team. But we didn't bring in dolphins. We didn't bring in bears. We didn't bring in bengals. We didn't bring in cardinals. We brought in horses. And here come the colts. So now we got horsepower not only running around a track, we got horsepower running around a football field. And after a few years, the power of one person, the power of one individual with infinite possibilities to drive those horses. Now, they're going to pay a ton to this man. And he's going to be worth it all because he does inspire many people in this town and he drives it to a championship. He put the power of one with infinite possibilities. And oftentimes it was on a field of blue. Blue can be about blue skies, 
to sing in the blues. Yep. But blues can also be about your throat chakra and communication and the power of one individual with infinite possibilities to communicate on a football field. He can communicate on camera, off camera. He'll get you buying pizza and you weren't even hungry. <laughs> Just saying. Now, here's another one. I want you to take the Archangel Michael. Yeah, yeah. Lots of power, lots of beauty, lots of love, a lot of protection in the Archangel Michael. A lot of power in the name Michael. And I want you picturing him swimming in the sacred river Jordan. Holy river, holy water Jordan. And when he comes out, he's got the 23rd Psalm on his heart. And we're going to put him on a bull. And we're going to put red all around the bull. Give it to me. There you go. And he's going to win another championship. He's going to change an industry. It is all around us all the time. It is in the numbers. It is in the words. It is in the colors. See it. Use it. Embrace it. Love it. Because life sees you. Life uses you. Life embraces you. Life loves you. Pay heed to coincidence, for life's game is at play. Nothing just happens in a haphazard way. Not all events are random that make up your day. We've all had the moments pieces fall into place. Circumstances are perfect. It's the right time, the right space. A brutal tragedy is defeated by a saving grace. Your book falls open to the needed page. Opportunity knocks as if cued to the stage. Perfect music is scored, and it defines the age. Then the heart's torn to pieces from immeasurable grief. The wrong place, the wrong time, with no sign of relief, leaving the devout even questioning their belief. There out a sign is perceived, a message gets through, a spirited hello with much love sent to you. One can heal with the salve of knowing what's true. Timing is everything isn't uttered by nuts. The chance and encounters, that can be anything but. Fortune's luck of the draw, it begins with a cut. I don't mean to suggest that we don't have a choice, options to opt from, an opinion to voice, the freedom to hate, or in love to rejoice. You create your destiny one day at a time. You can do it with reason. You can do it with rhyme. And yes, lousy happens as life turns on a dime. But in all ways, there's purpose to this grand facade Fate has built empires. History changed with a nod. There's a design to the universe, the blueprints of God. Two events coincide to give you a clue, especially when dropped right out of the blue. Heaven sent you direction, a suggestion or two. The plan's so much grander than most mortals believe. You may harvest synchronicity, but God plants the seed with the love and the knowing that what will be, will be. Namaste. Annie Truesdale. That's okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Annie, I want to say on behalf of everyone here, thank you for the work that you do in the world. Thank you very much. And um, I've enjoyed receiving for quite some time now the newsletter you send out through email, God mm -hmm. Signs. Why don't you tell everyone out there how they can subscribe to that and receive it as well? 
Um, if you just go to GodSign um, online at gmail.com and just send me an email, I'll send it out to you. It goes out a couple times a month. And what does the number 22 mean? What does the color green mean? If I keep seeing deer, why, what's that about? And that's what those are about, is trying to help you understand all the signs and symbols. Awesome. I'd like to have all of our speakers come out now, including Yay! Jennifer Brandusi and Mr. Stephen Ross. Let's give a warm round of applause for these awesome individuals. And our awesome MC, Richard. And the band, let's give it up for the band. And most of all, I want to give it up for you guys because you guys are now part of the Walk the Talk tribe. Your official members for coming and helping to support this. Our goal is to take this on the road and go nationwide and even farther if we can. Um, it's, it's really cool. I've been also been working with, uh, or we've been working with Amplify Hope, and they're helping us create a Walk the Talk as a not-for-profit. So if you know any sponsors, have them call me. <laughs> um, because it takes money to make this work, and, you know, all the money that we get goes right back into this. Um, we've been at the Vogue. We've been at the Buzzkirk Chumley. We've been here. We're going down to um, Nashville, Brown County for July 20th. Uh, creating happiness. That's the encore of our one in, in um, at the Buzzkirk Chumley. It's an amazing, creating happiness is an amazing walk the talk. Um, it'd be like this one if we took it somewhere else, but it's it's different. It's six women who have each have a message about how they created happiness in their life, whether it was through a death experience or a bad boyfriend. <laughs> so. Anyway, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's July 20th, Brown County Playhouse. If you've never been there, Nashville, Indiana is a beautiful place to take a road trip to. Doors are at 7 p.m., 7.30, come early, get a, something to eat, and the, let the energy of Brown County and our Walk the Talk there surround you. And then October 24th is our next event, and that's going to be on the topic of overcoming fear. We've all had to face overcoming fear in one way or another. Auditions are September 22nd, 23rd. If you want to audition, walk the talk series at gmail.com. That's me, and I will give you an audition slot. So anyway, so what do we do next? Huh? Oh, yeah! Okay, yeah, open up. Op we're going to open up these, uh, these windows because it's beautiful outside tonight, I think. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. These, so you, if you guys don't know, this theater was built in, like, 1880. And you just can't imagine some of the things that have happened here. So we're going to open the stained glass windows, and we're going to bring up the house lights, because up above your guy's head is our motivational balloon drop. <laughs> and the reason we call it that is because inside each balloon is a motivational phrase, and you can pop it right now and read it, or you can take it home like a fortune cookie and read it later. But it's, it's one of our signatures that we do to make Walk the Talk more fun, and, you know, bring people's energy into it. And once again, thank you all. This is a blessing that you guys came out. And thanks for supporting Walk the Talk. So you guys ready for the balloon drop? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Woo! Oh. Throw those balloons around. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And you can dance if you want. Brother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we got to find a way to bring some love in. Father, we don't need to escalate. Oh, war is not the answer, for only you can conquer. You know we got to find a way, got to find a way to bring some love in today. Make it last. 
good time Sister Don't punish me Sister. With brutality Sister Talk to me Sister So you can see Us going on 